Welcome to chapter three. We're going to be talking about operationism and essentialism. You know, those terms you use every day. Let's get started. Okay, so I pulled this from the internet and it's from a website called the Climate Reality Project and it says, headline, the science is settled. 97% of climate scientists agree that human activity is driving a climate crisis all across the earth. We know it's happening and we know why. Carbon pollution from fossil fuels is warming our planet and throwing natural systems out of balance. You don't have to look far to see the results. Hotter temperatures, stronger storms, rising seas, and so much more. Threatening the health of our families in the future, we pass on to generations to come. Okay. Claims of perfect or absolute knowledge tend to choke off inquiry. Because a free and open pursuit of knowledge is a prerequisite for scientific activity, scientists are always skeptical of claims that the ultimate answer has been found. That quote comes from our textbook. I pulled it back in the, I think, ninth edition, so my page number might not correspond to your edition of the textbook. So let's compare what's, what scientists say we should be doing on the right side of the screen with the assertions being made on the left side of the screen. The science is settled. It's a really common phrase in certain areas, and that's why I pulled climate change, because it's a, it's a really common frame, phrase in climate research. Climate, especially when uh, the media talks about it. I don't know that scientists say it quite as, as broadly as that, but in the media and other sources, you know, politicized sources, things like that, you'll hear these very firm, let's stop discussing this, this has been settled, 97% of climate scientists agree, so what does that imply about the 3%? What do, you, what do you think is going on with the 3% of climate scientists who don't agree? Hmm, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because 97%, that's, you know, almost everyone, but that means there are 3%. So if there's only 100 climate scientists in the world, three of them are like, I don't know what you guys, I'm not sure we can say these things. Are, are the three who are saying, I'm not sure, are they truthers, to take us back to chapter two? Are they making unfalsifiable claims and they aren't really doing science? Like, what are we supposed to infer from this, the science is settled article that the Climate Reality Project posted on their website? This is a hot button topic. And so, it, and in fact, in your assignment for, for chapter two, you read an article where um, it talked about different conspiracy theories. And one of the conspiracy theories that it offered was the failure to believe in global warming as if it's something that needs to be believed in like Bigfoot or something that needs to be be believed in like, um, you know, whether 9-11 was an inside job or something kind of, kind of a different topic really than those other things. Right. Um, but see how it was presented in the article that I assigned you. Look how they talk about it here. The idea that we've all agreed, so stop asking questions is basically what, the, what they're arguing. But scientists are always skeptical of claims that the ultimate answer has been found. So shouldn't those three people who are questioning what has now become the status quo argument, shouldn't they be looked at as good scientists rather than possibly people who are, should be shunned and marginalized. I guess it det determines, uh, it's determined by whether we're taking a scientific view of the question or if we're taking sort of more of a um, policy approach to the question. And those really are two separate things, right? So we're going to talk about the scientific approach. So I use that example at the beginning just to get us sort of in the mindset of the fact that there are different ways to talk about issues, right? So let's start off with a nice philosophical approach to information. It's called essentialism. So it's a philosophical endeavor where we are urged to break down concepts into their essential components. Break the, break the topic down into what it really is. So here we have a cartoon, Gravity Wilson, try it sometime. But what is essentially gravity? Physicists have not really fully figured it out. Like what, 
what is it that makes a larger object pull smaller objects towards it? Like, what is that force? They really don't know what it is, but are we able to study it? Are we able to use it? <laughs> are we um, able to try and break it as we jump? <laughs> Stuff like that. Um, yeah, absolutely. It is, it is a thing, even though we don't know what exactly makes up the thing. So in chapter two, I talked about reifying hypotheses, you know, trying to, to treat a hypothesis as if it is a concrete thing when in fact it's an abstract thing. Here we're talking about um, the idea that in essentialism that we should figure out what all the different little components of the abstract thing is before we can really move forward on studying the abstract thing. The thing is that I said thing a lot of times, I, I apologize for that. Uh, scientific concepts aren't necessarily essential. Think about that for a second. We don't necessarily have to know exactly what makes up the concept in order for us to study it. So I thought it would be fun to use a psychological example. Hypnosis. Going all the way back to when Freud and Breuer were attempting to access people's unconscious, uh, Breuer really argued that the way to do it was through hypnosis, that if we could hypnotize a person, they, their conscious, uh, you know, protective mechanisms would go away and they would be able to um, reveal what their unconscious contains. So for like the entire history of psychology, we've been interested in hypnosis. And so let's talk about it as an essential question. What is hypnosis? Well, one thought is that it's an altered state of consciousness that when you enter hypnosis, it's kind of like if you were to enter sleep or you were to get drunk or whatever, that it's an all, it actually changes the way that your brain is functioning so that you're experiencing the world in a different way, an altered state of consciousness. Okay. And a lot of researchers have looked at that possible explanation that, that you actually are experiencing the world differently when you're hypnotized. What about stage hypnotists? Um, some people have argued that when people are on the stage and they're hypnotized, they get sort of swept up with the situation and engaged in the role that they're playing. I'm playing the role of a hypnotized person, and this is what a hypnotized person would do. And so they do behaviors that um, are not necessarily typical of them in their normal everyday life, but it's not necessarily a revealing of an altered state of consciousness. It just means that they're, you know, wrapped up in the role that they're playing. Okay, so that's one, another like part of part of hypnosis is probably being explained by altered state of consciousness. Part of hypnosis might be being explained as, you know, it's a role that you're playing. Another part of a hypnosis might be really about the suggestibility. And actually you could see how, you know, role playing, it could be um, more effective when you're really suggestible, right? Like you're really taking on the suggestions that the um, hypnotist is providing. So if the hypnotist tells you, you know, this roll of paper towels weighs a uh, hundred pounds, um, you know, being hypnotized makes you more suggestible. And so you actually play the role of a person trying to pick up a hundred pounds. So you could kind of see how like maybe all of these interact too. Um, research on pain management using hypnosis suggests that it might be a dissociation where the person is able to actually mentally separate their conscious experience, like what they think is going on from their physical experience, what's really going on. Um, they've done research on people who are having uh, cavities filled and so they have to have their teeth drilled on and stuff. And through hypnosis, they can endure the, the treatment without Novocaine and they'll wake up from the hypnosis and say, no, I didn't feel anything. Right. And so the, the hypothesis in that case would be, well, they separated themselves from the pain. Okay. So maybe that's what's going on. Long story short, we don't know what's going on in hypnosis. We have lots of different um, hypotheses about what might be going on, but here's the great part that we don't need to essentially define what hypnosis is in order for us to study hypnosis. I could make my assertion that it's an altered state of consciousness. And then I could do all my research focusing in on the, the argument that it's an altered state of consciousness, right? You could make this, you could see how we could study the little parts of it without having to know in general, what is this bigger concept? So in science, we don't necessarily um, rely on having to know exactly what the thing is before we can study it. Instead, we, we use something called operationism, where 
our, this is also a philosophical term, by the way. In science, we say that as long as the concepts, or at least the things that we're measuring about the concepts are observable and measurable, then we can move forward. So as long as what we're looking for, what we're um, studying is observable and measurable, we're good to go. When we say observable and measurable, it's not only observable to the individual who's studying it or experiencing it, but it needs to be also verifiable by others. So for example, dreaming is a tricky one. And again, it's something that Freud relied on as, as an access to the unconscious. Um, no one else can verify what happened in your dream, right? I, I think we can't even really verify what happened in our dreams because have you ever noticed if you start to tell somebody about a really weird dream that you had, a lot of times you're sort of forgetting the dream as you're describing it, right? <laughs> like I'm losing track of even what the story is as I'm telling it to you. So it's like, are we even good, um, you know, viewers of our own dreams, let alone somebody else being able to verify our dreams. Um, so in operationism, we're going to have to limit ourselves to certain subjects, things that are directly observable, things that are measurable, and that can be verified by other people right? We talked about public verifiability back in chapter one, right? We want to make sure that other people can observe and uh, measure and compare their results. So certain subjects might be off limits for us if we're going to take the scientific approach. Um, so dreams are kind of a tough one, like the content of the dreams are a tough one to study if we're going to follow operationism. Now that we dream, now that is, that is observable and measurable, right? We can, um, have a person sleep at the sleep lab with electrodes on their on their scalp and um, electrodes under their eyes to detect when their eyes start rolling around in REM sleep and we can go wake them up during different stages of sleep and see if they report that they're dreaming and through research like that we've discovered that people seem to only report dreams when they were in REM sleep and about 95% of the time they report a dream if they're awakened from REM sleep. So we've been able to observe and measure what's, what stage of sleep a person experiences a dream. Other people can verify that. Now, do we know what they were dreaming? No, all we know is that they were dreaming. So let's talk about another construct. So we had talked about hypnosis. It's kind of a construct. We're not exactly sure what's going on. Love is another construct right? We're not exactly sure what's going on in love. Um, if you remember yourself being younger and you were wondering, maybe you still wonder this, how will I know when I'm in love? People who have been in love oftentimes will tell you, oh, you'll know it when you see it. And it's like, oh, that's helpful. Thank you. I wouldn't have asked you this question if I've ever seen it before. So what am I supposed to do? Um, so let's look at it like a, a, a construct. And let's think about what, what is love in an objective, um, you know, measurable, independently verifiable way. What is love? Well, we might argue for one thing that when people are in love, that they are more distracted by the object of their affection. Um, it's harder to keep your mind on your schoolwork when you're thinking about the, you know, love in your life or something. Um, so maybe it's distractibility. So what I'm going to have you do is watch in the playlist. It'll just run you right into this love lab um, example where they measured distractibility and really what they were looking at is attraction, but we could imagine that maybe love is a component, that attraction is a component of love. So I'm going to have you watch this video. I'll give you a fair warning that this guy has a pretty strong Scottish accent. So brace yourself for that. And he talks kind of quietly. So you might have to watch it a couple of times to hear his description, but I will see you on the other side of this video.